shall we begin our review of uh, Hebrews? Yes. So I want to start with sort of an apologetic point or with a predominant interpretation. So let's turn to chapter 10, verse 19. And therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way which he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So keeping that in mind, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were no people, now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So, because Christ is our high priest, and because we are a royal priesthood, we don't need an ordained priesthood. We ourselves are the priests, and we can go approach Christ directly. We can approach God through Christ directly. So there's no need for an ordained priesthood. Is that correct? I would say it is. But if you're talking about in worship versus just a relationship? Well, the question becomes really what is the author talking about? Hmm. And how are we to understand that the the uh, those verses from chapter 10 what is what is his meaning and you know how much can we expand them to into possibly into an area beyond his meaning well i i've got it written down here <laughs> <laughs> that it, it it means worship. Um, that it's the drawing near. Let us draw near with a true heart. I've got yeah. I've got. Oh, a I see. Yeah. Worship. This right. Well, so first of all, in terms of approaching God, so let's assume the correctness of that position that you don't need an ordained priesthood. So the worshiping or the drawing near the whatever, the approaching God then becomes an individual activity because each of us is a priest, right? But Hebrews is also talking about the people in a community. It's the community of God. Right, even in, even in that verse, he's talking about the people of God. Right. And even in in First uh, Peter, he's talking about uh, a race, a mm -hmm. royal priesthood, a holy nation. Yeah, so he's got the whole group, not just in so, the God's own people. This is about a group. So the reality is that you could always, an individual believer could always approach God directly. You didn't need a priest or an intermediary. Any individual could approach God. But the that's not the author's focus. Mm -mm. And so in talking about a priesthood, so let's 
begin go back to you know sort of the basics what is what is a priest one who gives sacrifice right someone who presents sacrifices and offerings before god uh, someone who is an intermediary between god and man so if we're priests in a royal priesthood how are we priests? What are we sacrificing? We are not sacrificing ourselves. <laughs> exactly, Thais. Good. We're sacrificing ourselves. Now, so we're sacrificing ourselves. <laughs> so, you know, each of us just goes out and lays ourselves on the altar and and uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> but this is a communal context, right? So, although each of us can sacrifice ourselves as a liturgical action. That's which is what the author is concerned about, right? He's concerned about liturgy. The Day of Atonement is a liturgical action. The form, the the making of covenant, is a liturgical action. So his focus is on liturgy. It's not on, you know, this kind of willy nilly here I go sacrificing myself kind of thing. So. those sacrifices of each individual worshiper have to be combined in some form and presented to God. And so for that, you need an ordained priest or in the author's time, you need a bishop we are part of the liturgical action as individuals only to the extent that our sacrifice is combined with the sacrifice, with each of our sacrifices are combined. So going back to the mass, remember, in the epiclesis, the Holy Spirit is summoned to transform the gifts in the first epiclesis to transform the gifts into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the second epiclesis, our sacrifice is combined with the sacrifice of Christ and presented back to God the Father. We're a royal priesthood to the extent that we ourselves as individuals sacrifice ourselves to, pre to present, to join our sacrifice with that of Christ. But we're not priests in mm -hmm. any broader sense than that. So this doesn't obviate the need for a, uh, an ordained priesthood. That is a total misunderstanding of the end misinterpretation of the author's position and it's also a total misunderstanding and misinterpretation of of first peter that's not what is meant here that's not the context it reminds me of the individual you know the individual acts we do as a parish community also for instance saint vincent de paul social justice um helping you know people in many ways and mm -hmm. combined actions. We are always joining together our actions for a greater gift. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that, that, that emphasis, you know, we, we um, in the Eucharist, we talk about how we're molded into one people of God. And there's mm -hmm. a way in which we, we really don't believe it. 
I would take it very seriously and we tend to focus on ourselves as individuals. And often we above all focus on, am I going to go to heaven? Which is mm -hmm. not really where the focus is, should be. The focus should be on the kingdom of God here and now. Mm -hmm. And the focus also should be on ourselves as a people of God. And so that's where the author's focus is. Uh, what he's apologetically trying to do is ensure that existing Christians remain Christians and remain part of the people of God. So the decision is, do you want to be part of the people of God or don't you? And if you leave, then there are very serious consequences from his perspective there's no going back let's go to uh, chapter 1 verse 1 the very beginning of Hebrews we had a long discussion about it when we first read it but now we've covered 11 chapters so it's meaning should be uh, as a in many ways as a, as a summary of the whole work it, its meaning should be even richer now than it was when we discussed it when how long have we been doing this Mary? Um, since two and a half years. April 19th 2022. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> okay, so first chapter one, verse one. In many and various ways, God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the ages. What does it mean within the context of chapters 1 through 11? Mm -hmm. and, and in what way can it be seen as a, a summary of the entire work? At this time, the Jewish population did not have a New Testament. They only had the Old Testament. So speaking of the, you know, through the prophets was in the Old Testament. And what mm -hmm. he, um, the author is trying to do is say, but we have a better, something better now, and that's uh, th the words and actions of the son. And that that's mm -hmm. what we're to be following. Right. Through the ages. And then it goes on, he reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. And if you think about all the things he said, did, but that's, and he's trying to remind the people, this is who you should be following now, rather than sticking with the old. Mm -hmm. Signs, wonders, and miracles. That was it. Mm. Right. Yeah. So, we have a basic continuity. God speaks. So God is always speaking. That lends salvation history a basic continuity. There's Nothing that is um, inexplicable, nothing that is you know particularly surprising. God is fundamentally the same all the time. And so God speaks. God always speaks. The discontinuity is introduced by whom he's speaking to. Right. He speaks to the prophets, 
and he speaks to a son. The message to the prophets is molded to the person of the prophet. Mm -hmm. The son is the son. Mm -hmm. Communication is is not a there's total fidelity of communication. There's no need to mold the message to its recipient. And so what underpins that? What device is he using here implicitly? He's using typology. Oh, this is a typological statement. So God speaks, he speaks to the prophets, he speaks to his son, God always speaks. God speaking to the prophets points forward to his speaking to his son. There's a typological relationship between the two. And what's what's typological? Uh, typological is a... <laughs> You, you, we often hear it in terms of the Old Testament predicts the New Testament, yeah. but predicts is a really horrible word, which um, is that whether these are predictions in any strict sense is very, you know, questionable. Typology means basically that God is always active in history mm. and God fundamentally do always does the same things in history. However, God's activity changes the context within which God acts. And so Isaiah says God's word cannot return to him void, but accomplishes that for which it purposes. Mm. So God's word and changes the context within which God's word is active. So we see mm. a progressive a, a progression. And so typology basically means that as God's word act, it transforms and escalates the context within which it acts. And so as a result, we have a type and the escalation is called an anti-type or a reverse anti-type. So, and, and the types are fundamental. They're, I mean, they can be kind of minor, you know, sort of in an interesting way, but they too, but they really have to be fundamental to salvation history. So Moses is the prophet par excellence, the giver of the law. He had direct communication with God. And Deuteronomy says that God will, Moses says that God tells him that God will give the Israelites, a prophet like Moses. So the prophet oh. like Moses become, is the antitype. And who is that prophet? The prophet is Christ. Oh. So we have basically the fulfillment of Old Testament promises in oh. the New Testament expressed as typological relationships. So that's really in many ways the the uh, the way in which the gospel writers, the New Testament writers, the early fathers of the church sort of reimagined the faith because um, you know so if we look at the you know disciples in, before the resurrection, they're clueless, right mm -hmm. they, Jesus talks about he's you know, going to 
go to Jerusalem and die and you know horrible things are going to happen and they hear a completely different message they hear you know that he's going to be glorified and then they ask which of them which of them is going to be first mm-hmm. <laughs> because because it's a wonderful story and they you know can smell themselves getting glory and power mm-hmm. they miss the suffering and the death or you know peter says i won't permit it as if you know he's going to stand up to uh the religious establishment or the roman state and stop anything mm. so they're clueless and so jesus is resurrected they encounter the resurrected christ but then how can this all be how can this person be the messiah cursed is he who hangs from a tree it's not a messiah at all so how do you get there how do you get there and remember you only have the old testament how do you get there how do you write the documents of the new testament and you have to reimagine and so this calls for reimagination and this is one of the works of reimagination and a very 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 powerful one Mm -hmm. also here if we regard Jesus as a prophet we have a clearly demarcated difference between the prophets and Jesus as a prophet. So we have, so he uses the prophets instead of Moses. So the prophetic message is really sort of a a carrot and stick one, right? It calls the Israelites to return to Yahweh and threatens them with horrendous consequences if they don't Mm. and 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 promises blessing if they do very much like the blessings and the curses and in Deuteronomy where everybody likes to likes to quote the quote the blessings but nobody likes to go up the curses. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, so, so that's the prophetic message. So there, the prophets, aside from Moses, and, and even Moses, if you take the inauguration of the covenant, are calling the Israelites to faithfulness, fidelity to the old covenant. Mm -hmm. And particularly to return to the old covenant for the prophets other than Moses. So that points to an issue of covenant which is underlying, which becomes critical to the author's argument later, but it's implicit already here. The prophet's call to for fidelity to the old covenant. Jesus both satisfies the requirements of the old covenant and inaugurates a new covenant for which he also satisfies the, rec- the the penalty for violating the covenant. Mm-hmm. So he does that simultaneously because he's the son. And so th- he then goes on to say that Jesus is higher than the angels. Why does he do that? In his divinity, he is higher than the angels. Mm-hmm. Just to... 
Mm. Why is that important? Because... I mean, why does he why does he include that in his argument? Um because um the angels are to worship him. And if he was lower, they wouldn't be. But when he's human, in this human form, he becomes lower than the angels. Uh-huh. Right. So it's in the service of developing a high Christology, which we'll talk about next. Anything else? God declared him as his son whom he had begotten. Mm -hmm. he's, so he's above all the angels there. Mm -hmm. and, and what's what's the significance of that? So we'll discuss the Christology of it next, but what else? He's heir a couple to the of, what, Mary? He's heir to the throne as a son. But what about angels? Oh, um, what about angels? Why is he focusing on angels at all? So first of all, remember in the Old Testament, the presence of God is often confused with the presence of angels. And so Jacob wrestles with God. Did he really wrestle with God and win? Or did he wrestle with an angel? Um, in numerous places, you know, it says that God speaks, but it's the voice of the angel that is speaking. So there's often, because they're messengers, the messenger is considered to be the one who sent the messenger, which is God. So when the prophets hear the message, they think they're hearing God, but they're hearing the angels saying what God wants them to say. Is that what you're saying? In some cases, but yeah, yeah. Um, but specifically or critically in this case, the angels in, in uh, Jewish interpretation, the angels were thought to be the messengers who brought the Mosaic law to Moses, who spoke the Mosaic law to Moses not God directly. So here again, we have angels giving the law versus the son giving the law. Mm -hmm. One is necessarily higher than the other. So Chapter 2, verse 2. For if the message declared by angels was valid, and so he's talking about the Mosaic law here, message declared by angels, the laws that's given to Moses. And every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Mm -hmm. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard him, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his own will. Is that also typology where like um, it's just showing Jesus superiority over the angels, mm -hmm. but like the new covenant it is it is typological, yeah. Yeah. Typological. Yes. The angels are part of his developing a high Christology. 
the high Christology focuses on Jesus as as the Son of God. Uh, I mean, we see the high Christology the very beginning, uh, verse two. But in these last days, he is of chapter one. He spoke to us by a son whom he appointed the heir of all things. So heir of son, heir of all things, through whom also he created the ages. So coexistent with God, created the ages. He reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. The nature of the son is the same as the nature of God. Mm -hmm upholding the universe by his word of power. If his word of power stops being spoken, the universe collapses upon itself. It's not sustainable without his word of power. So that's a high Christology. So why does he go to such lengths to develop a high Christology. Because of the importance of his people that he's speaking to following this person. He has to show his importance. Well, why can't he just be some poor guy who went to the cross and got crucified and no. happened no. to get resurrected? Why? He has to be with God. <laughs> how, how come? He's going to be ruling heaven. He's he's in charge of the kingdom. And, and it's a new order. It's a new day. A new <laughs> before they were following the prophets, they're following the Mosaic law. He has to be something greater. Is it like through suffering? Like mm -hmm. through the suffering? Mm -hmm. That's one of the things he argues. He argues that through suffering, he's perfected. And then crown because it's like you have, it's a, like the suffering in death is now crown and, and suffering is important. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what I know. And then that's what kind of what Mary was saying was when he's exalted and then put into that position. And that's when you have that cryo Christology. Mm -hmm. He's the high priest. Yeah. You, so if he is, so a priest is offers sacrifices serves as a mediator between God and man. A mm. Any human priest who is only a human priest um, can offer himself, but then that, that gets rid of the priesthood. Mm. Or he can offer, you know, animal sacrifices. But those are really, those are only superficial because a human priest is only a very imperfect mediator between sinful man and God because the priest himself is sinful. So that doesn't, can never ever change anything. On the other hand, a purely divine priest can't do very much either. I mean, fundamentally, the violation of the covenant means, remember, the de a death has to occur. The animal sacrifices merely indicate what happens if the covenant mm -hmm. is violated. So death is necessary. The requirements of the covenant uh, by <clears throat> a being who is purely divine 
can't accomplish anything because God can't be killed. Mm. So what's needed is a being mm. who is both human and divine. That divine being experiences suffering because Jesus is 100% divine and 100% human. So the divine portion of Jesus experiences suffering and death. And the human portion of Jesus the divine. submits his will to the divine will yeah. and experiences death. So it's a perfect mediation between as a priest between man and God, because that priest offers himself and that sacrifice is able to satisfy the requirements of a broken covenant and a new covenant. Mm -hmm. So that priest has to be both human and divine. Without that, the entire, everything becomes meaningless. Mm. It would otherwise be a total exercise in futility. Mm. It didn't get very far. Well, so, we will, well, but we will uh, next week. We right? will next week. Yeah, we, we'll continue. There's a little bit more about Christology and then I also want to discuss dating because the uh, you know many many scholars tend to kind of line the books of the New Testament up based on their Christology and so they argue mm -hmm. that Hebrews is a very late work which which I you know, strongly dispute. I think that's absurd. And so we'll just finish discussing Christology and then discuss whether Hebrew should be dated early or late. Early as I believe, late as a huge, probably a preponderance of scholars believe. 